is Keys to the Shop, episode 413, Training and Coffee Education at Origin with Fabiola Solano of Soy Barista in Costa Rica. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFirio. I'm your host for the show. As always, I am so glad to have you here listening to Keys to the Shop, especially those of you who are new to the show. Welcome. I really hope you take time to subscribe to the show. It keeps you updated with all of the new content coming out monthly. There's about 10 different publications per month, from Founder Friday episodes to Rate of Rise roasting-focused episodes. We have shift breaks that are shorter format on Thursdays. And then we finally have the main episode, one you're listening to right now on Tuesdays. We just try to present a lot of great topics and conversations to help you run an amazing coffee business. So thank you so much for subscribing and also share these episodes. Share on social media, especially with your followers, that Keys to the Shop is here as a resource for the global coffee retail professional community. So thanks again so much. And I want to let you know that Keys to the Shop, on top of doing this podcast, also offers consulting and coaching for you and your business. You want to take your operations, your people, and your quality to the next level. You want to solve some pretty specific problems or have a trusted advisor on your side working through projects and opportunities that your business is currently presented with then working with Keys to the Shop Consulting might be the right fit for you. I've been working with a lot of people one-on-one over the past few years. It's been wonderful to walk through either the opening of their first cafe or, like I said, taking their existing operations and helping them really find clarity and further develop a thriving coffee business. If you are interested in getting one-on-one coaching with me and working with Keys to the Shop Consulting, go ahead and email Chris at keys to the shop.com. We'll set up a free discovery call and talk all about what you got going on and how keys to the shop consulting can help you. Again, that email for keys to the shop consulting, Chris at keys to the shop.com. One thing that is absolutely true is that you could have the best quality coffee, but if you don't have great equipment, you're limited on what you can do. At least you're limited on how the customer experiences that coffee. And now every now and then somebody comes along and takes technology to the next level so that it can take coffee to the next level. And that is what the ground control Cyclops Brewer from Voga Coffee is all about. The SCA award-winning technology allows you to access a range of flavors and a depth of flavor that was previously not able to be accessed by traditional batch brew coffee equipment. Not only does this machine make amazing batch brew coffee, but also makes tea, batch diced lattes, batch cold brews. So it introduces a whole range of different revenue streams for your business and puts you in control of how your coffee is presented to your customer. Check them out at groundcontrol.coffee today. I think if you're looking to elevate your quality, improve workflow, get versatility and profitability, the Ground Control Cyclops Brewer is something you need to get in your cafe. Check them out again over at groundcontrol.coffee. As a longtime barista, I am a huge fan of any time where I get to present to a customer something that delights them. They might be having a bad day, they might just have a normal day, but no matter what, I want them to be able to count on what I hand them and I need to be able to count on the things that I work with to create that beverage. When it comes to plant-based beverages, I've always loved working with the Pacific Barista Series. And the Barista Series is the line of plant-based performance beverages that is created for baristas and approved by baristas around the world so that no matter what you use from their extensive lineup, you can trust that it will stand up to the heat from steaming, produce an awesome silky texture, and also be balanced so it focuses the flavor on the coffee. This is why it's called a performance beverage. Check them out at pacificfoodservice.com. Get samples and try it for yourself. I think you will be impressed, and so will your customers. Again, if you're looking for the best in plant-based beverages to serve your guests, I think it has to be the Barista Series from Pacific. Okay, everybody. Well, today we are in for a treat. We get to talk all about education and training for baristas and 
get to talk about it from the perspective of a professional trainer in Costa Rica. Today, we're talking with Fabiola Solano in Costa Rica. Fabiola is certified with the coffee diploma and is an authorized SCA trainer. She began her work in coffee as a barista in 2013. She has her bachelor's degree in business administration, a degree in marketing, and a specialization in hotel operations management. And she's currently studying for the Certificate of Advanced Studies in Coffee Excellence at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. She has dedicated herself to content creation since 2015 for her blog, Soy Barista. And she's always focusing on updated and relevant content and data for the Spanish-speaking coffee community. She's been really investing herself in this community as an educator, as a trainer, and has had a front row seat in the development of the coffee culture, retail coffee and roasting coffee culture, and educational development of Costa Rica specifically. And so today we are going to be talking with Fabiola all about her experience getting into coffee, becoming an educator, but also being educated about coffee and the unique experience of being in a producing country and being an educator and all of the unique challenges that that presents and all of the unique opportunities. So it's a really rich conversation where we talk about her keys to educating people for retention of information, for developing mature professionals and business owners, and of course, the evolution of the coffee culture in Costa Rica. And so it was really awesome to talk with Fabiola today. I hope you really enjoy this conversation. I definitely did. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Here now is my conversation with Fabiola Solano. Okay, Fabiola, welcome to Keys to the Shop. How are you? I'm doing good, Chris. Thank you for having me today here. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is going to be a fascinating conversation. And I always love talking about education and training. And, you know, me being in the US and then, you know, I I have my own assumptions about, you know, where the industry is and how to approach things. But I always love to get the perspective of the global coffee community. That's going to be really fascinating to talk about your perspective from Costa Rica and being a longtime educator and trainer and barista, just tell us a little bit about how you got into this. I imagine it was just as a barista, I guess, right? Yes, I started as a barista. But while coming from a coffee-producing country, you start drinking coffee basically right when you were born. And so, yeah, basically I've been drinking coffee my whole life. And that's when it all started. So that was just a cultural inheritance that you had, but then it became something different. Like you, this became something that you did professionally. Yes, exactly. Well, a lot of people have the same dream as mine, which is owning a coffee shop, which I don't own. (laughs) Uh, But everything started like that, like having the idea of owning a coffee shop. So where do you go? Well, you start with a barista course. And that's how I got into coffee education, basically. Yeah. So you started as a learner of coffee and, and barista skills, and then you applied it by becoming a barista, I imagine. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, in Costa Rica, there is like the official barista course to start with. And then I wanted to learn a, bit, a little bit more. And then I took a second course and then I had my first job as a barista that didn't last long because the the place closed after two weeks of me being around and yeah, everything started from there and I kept, well, looking for barista jobs, which at that time weren't that, so coffee shops wouldn't look for a barista that often. They would look for someone who could make coffee, but that didn't mean that they were looking for a barista. Well, why is that? Can you explain a little bit more about that? <laughs> yeah. So basically, the barista culture is very new in Costa Rica, even though the, the barista championship has been done for a while now, over 15 years. But coffee shops not necess- necessarily are looking for a barista, you know, a professional that knows how to make coffee. Most coffee shops that are not specialty are looking for just a person that knows how to operate the espresso machine. 
And yeah, uh, I started 10 years ago. So there were very few specialty coffee shops. Okay. So you had to basically work in a place that, you know, today maybe you wouldn't have chosen to work in, or it was just a limited availability just to keep your skills fresh. It was a limited availability, but I ended up working at a place that did worried about good coffee. So um, even though it was very short, I really enjoyed it because it was also a bookshop and I love books. So (laughs) books and coffee, that was the deal. That's excellent. So, okay, let's think about then why you wanted to just continue learning about coffee versus other people who they were maybe worked as a barista or worked in a cafe. This is not what they want to do long term, though. But it, apparently, this is something you decided to do long term. What was it that kind of propelled you forward as you went year after year? Well, there's a cultural part of it. So Costa Rica has been producing coffee over 200 years, and basically, the entire country was built on coffee. So everyone loves coffee here, but that doesn't mean that people know much about coffee, like the the general people. So I decided to investigate more. Like, yeah, we produce coffee and we have excellent coffee. We know that, but we're not drinking it. And that's something that has shifted from the moment that I started. But yeah, the, the reality is that most coffee gets exported the highest quality gets exported. So I wanted to learn more about how we could get very high quality coffees in the country that they were already produced. And so I started this journey of learning more and how to also have better techniques and what was going on and the outside world, basically, because there are two worlds, the the producing countries and the consuming countries. They are very different. I wanted to to learn more and more. And yeah, that was what took me to become a coffee trainer, basically. So as a coffee trainer, and you're educating your community and helping them like raise up the baseline of understanding of a product that's been, you know, created the country, like you say, so that they can produce more quality for the people of Costa Rica and in the cafes. I mean, how did that get received initially as you started to educate people? Was there resistance to that? Or was it just like, if we, we've never heard this before, give us more? Yeah, probably the second option. Because the thing is, and this is a fact, that in Costa Rica, well, it, it depends on, on the crop, but even 50% of the coffee that is drunk in the country, it's imported. So we're not even drinking Costa Rican coffee. And a lot of people don't know that. So whenever you present them with very good, high quality coffee, most people will accept it. And then they will want to learn more and drink more. And that's the shift that I have seen, which has been very positive in the past 10 years. Okay, so now... You're talking like like Nespresso coffees imported for just kind of like more commodity grade coffees and and the like, right? Yeah, not necessarily Nespresso. They are Costa Rican <laughs> brands that sell imported coffee, but it's not written on the label. Mm, okay, so it's <laughs> from Costa Rica, but it's not from Costa Rica. Exactly. Like it, it was roasted in Costa Rica, but that doesn't mean that the coffee was harvested in Costa Rica. Okay. So now as an educator, you have to make sure that you are relaying information in a way that people are retaining it. And it's going to be something that just like your own journey in learning more about coffee and you know, applying your skills as a barista and now as an educator, you needed to have a place to work that out. So how did you go about you know, kind of organizing the way that you train people, the way that you communicate so that it doesn't overwhelm them, but actually really helps them? Yeah, that is very important to not overwhelm people because, well, first off, the fact that just letting people know that they might not be drinking Costa Rican coffee in Costa Rica is quite a fact. So just keeping, first of all, language simple and then just go with them. Like I always ask people what their coffee knowledge is or what they 
think they know about coffee. And then we start off with that because also I, I train not only in Costa Rica, but I have done courses in Guatemala and in Mexico. And that's a very different context. So I always start by asking people, what do they think they know about coffee? And then they tell you, and then you kind of fill in the gaps. Yeah. <laughs> people tend to tell me like they, they don't know a thing. Oh, okay. So they, kind of starting from baseline. So you, you really have a, a blank canvas in a lot of ways as an educator to give people maybe their first introduction to this world of coffee that fascinated you in the beginning. Yes, actually, uh, the, my my favorite course to teach as an AST is Introduction to Coffee. Yeah, so that gives sort of the groundwork. And when you say what's changed over the past 10 years in Costa Rica, then you've done trainings in Guatemala and elsewhere. It's a different environment in, in Mexico, but these are all producing countries that yes. have a growing kind of in-country retail, roasting, and in brewing, et cetera, culture. So there has to be some kind of a common thread between all of, all of them. It, maybe I'm thinking about that wrong, but there's, it, what's the dynamic that maybe someone like myself, who's just from a consuming country, wouldn't really understand, but is definitely something you need to factor in when you're educating people and training them in these new markets? Well, for example, and one thing that I need to remember myself is that, for example, in Costa Rica, you see coffee plants everywhere. And maybe in Mexico, there are a lot of states that don't have coffee. So there are people that I have trained that have never seen a coffee plant. So that's something to think about. An example in Mexico as well is that they do have their best coffees or they retain the best coffees in the country because they don't export as much as in Costa Rica. We're a very small country and all the best coffees just get exported. So if all the best coffees are getting exported and you have to work with something to showcase what your country is doing in coffee. So I, I take it that you have access to some of the good stuff when you're talking with people, and maybe sometimes you don't. So how do you apply your knowledge and education in both of those situations, both when you don't have exactly the quality that you're looking for, but you know you could have, and when you actually do have that quality? Well, I normally get the quality because I have good relationship relationships with producers. But yeah, sometimes we don't have the best quality that we want to get for a, for teaching a course. So what I do is just let them know with transparency what, for example, the how the coffee that gets exported looks like or should taste like, for example. Because you get a lot of, yeah, this is the export quality, but you take a look at the green bean and you you know it's not the best quality. Oh, okay. So you're just transparent with people and let them know there's these different worlds of coffee that you're going to be interacting with. And in their, their careers, as they start to form careers in coffee, uh, that's just going to be the way it is. They might one day be working with some coffee that's not to their liking. And other times it's going to be easy to make good coffee because it is good coffee. Yes, exactly. I'm transparent with that because, well, of course, at first people want, when they are learning, they will want to get the highest quality. And that, well, you, you need to pay a price for that high quality, but then you have to sell it. And then the, the customer wants, uh, you need the customer to want to pay the price <laughs> that you are charging. And that's something that might be quite a challenge here still, in Costa Rica because, well, people are used to paying not such high prices for coffee. So they don't look a lot for the quality, but for the price. So then the owners of the coffee shops have to rethink like, okay, maybe I won't sell the, high, the highest quality, but maybe something good, which it doesn't translate to bad coffee, but it's still good. Do you think that education will and or does help overcome that hurdle in terms of a customer wanting to or being willing to pay more for good coffee 
they could go to a place where the staff don't know very much about it and they're not very educated on it or a place there where they are very educated on it. They're highly trained. Does that make a difference in customer retention over time when they interact with an educated group of professionals versus not so much? Yeah, definitely. It makes a, well, that's why I've seen this shift from the past 10 years What we, we would have like two specialty coffee shops in San Jose downtown. And now we, well, there aren't that much, but <laughs> there are maybe 10, 12 just downtown. And they do have a high fidelity uh, customer base, basically. Like you will always see the same people sitting at the coffee shop because they have learned what high quality is and where they can get it so they won't move from there. And yeah, definitely you can see now more people like interested in knowing more information when they are going to buy coffee for home because, well, that's one thing to know about Costa Rica, that people tend to drink a lot of coffee at home. And that's why coffee shops, most coffee shops won't open for breakfast from Monday through Friday. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Because I, I've known people that come here and it's like, well, but where can I get breakfast with a good quality coffee? And it's like, yeah, they open till 10, 11, <laughs> or even afternoon. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's really interesting. And, and it would make me think that a lot of people would want to also get into roasting automatically if they're going to open a coffee business to help sell coffee to the people who want to brew it in the morning. Yeah, that's actually what happens. You can go to a lot of coffee shops that have their own brand, their own yeah private label, basically, or they do roast by themselves. You can find a lot of coffee brands here so that people can take home and brew their own coffee. Well, it's great to have that strong culture of, of morning coffee. That's a great opportunity. And, you know, I was thinking about the fact that farmers will be more concerned about how their coffee is perceived by those who are buying it, right? And if it's a larger group of people buying their coffee that don't have as high of expectation of different maybe processing standards or or flavors, et cetera, that's what they're going to do because that's who buys their coffee. But I'm wondering if it's shifting where you have all these coffee bars and roasteries now as education starts to go up. Do you feel like there's a stronger connection to what farmers do on the farm related to what's happening in these coffee shops and the coffee shops that especially are roasting and, and buying the coffee? Yeah, there is a strong connection between coffee shops and the producers that, well, I can name maybe three coffee shops that have very strong relationships with multiple coffee farmers and they do visit them and they take their baristas and their staff and they also invite the producer to go and make coffee for people. So it's a very nice relationship where you can basically see who is producing your coffee and then the staff can go to the farm and see what the producer is doing. So how it translates to, to the bean. Great. So there's a good relationship there. And I imagine they, they might be more concerned over time with, hey, uh, you know, you're a, a small roasting chain, maybe a few shops in uh, San Jose or, or elsewhere, and we sell you this green coffee. What do you think about this? Is that conversation happening where they're wanting to sort of allow for that relationship to be a guiding factor in what they do on the farm? Yes, it is happening. And well, actually, next week, one of the oldest specialty coffee shops is presenting their yeah their products for this year, which means the, the new crop. And they have hundreds of samples and they copped all of them. And of course, they gave, they gave feedback to the producers and then they have a huge selection of coffees. So that is something that happens not, not only in this coffee shop, but other coffee shops that they have established great relationships with producers and you can see better qualities at the coffee shops. So that's, that's something very positive that has been happening for the past maybe five, six years. Okay, wonderful. I mean, as the industry matures in that respect regarding retail and roasting in country, um, so does also the 
availability of information and people that have maybe taken courses from you and you've taught have grown in their career. What does it mean to do continuing education past that point where it's like this introduction to coffee as an AST? Now there's a, a higher level of education that somebody wants because, hey, I've already uh, <laughs> gone through all of these different modules or I've been working for so many years. What's the natural next step for somebody in that position who wants to continue to further their career? It depends. Most baristas go into roasting, basically, and copying as well. Or they develop their own coffee brand, or they do events, for example. It depends. It's very, it, it varies a lot. Also, you see quite a few baristas that are also coffee producers. So it's like a, an infinite a feedback loop where they <laughs> taste what they are doing in the farm. So yeah, it depends. And, and that's interesting to me because that's not necessarily the case where like, you just mentioned a lot of different places where people can, you know, springboard from being a barista to opening their own roastery, opening their own shop, doing events. And so there's a, all of these different places to go with baristas in consuming countries. It's not so, <sighs> I don't know that it happens as often as that. And is that because there is a lot more of a opportunity because there's not as many people doing those things so they can kind of brand themselves easier by being a, a trained and certified barista that now it's easy for people to be like, yeah, wow, you know, we don't really see that very often. That's very attractive. I will interact with that. I will hire you. I will go to your place. Yeah, definitely. That happens a lot with coffee champions, like barista champions. And then people will move to the next place that that barista is located at. Um, as I told you, it can be maybe opening their own coffee shop or just moving to another coffee shop as well, or having their own brand, like maybe consulting or, yeah, as I mentioned, it depends, but yeah, a lot of people take advantage of that, which is great because we need more informed baristas to share knowledge with the consumers. So the education community is growing as well. Yes, definitely. When I started, there were only two schools. And I actually took the course 10 years ago because there, before that, there was only one coffee school. And now there maybe five, six, or even more, because universities have opened their own barista courses or, yeah, so different institutes, they have opened their, their barista courses or coffee courses. So it has definitely grown a lot in the passing years. How do you know the difference between, like if I was going to choose to get educated in coffee, what is the thing that I should be looking for that would best serve me to know that, you know, here's something that it's good, but, you know, this, this is great. What's the difference between that? Well, first of all, it depends on what kind of education are you looking for and what for. Is it just a hobby or do you want to open your own coffee shop or do you have some knowledge and want to move further? So that are the main points to start with, but then I will always look for the background of the P of, yeah, of the trainer. So what has this person done before? What's the background? And yeah, basically also very important is what kind of equipment do they have at this coffee school? Because this has become, at least here in Costa Rica, it has become like a competition of who has the best equipment. Oh, really? And, and so that's like synonymous with if you have really good equipment, you must be good at coffee. Yeah, exactly. So one of the schools that where I teach, actually, they just bought like the World Boise Championship equipment. So the, the espresso machine and the grinder as well. Let me ask you this, because is that a real benefit? Or is it something that's very attractive, but it won't translate as well to what your students will, you know, because if they leave the school, for instance, they're not going to necessarily be going to a store that has that same machine. Yeah. 
<laughs> it is a benefit. So it's attractive for sure, but it's also a benefit because then people know what a very high quality equipment is and the reality of what you can get with the budget that you have. <laughs> no, that's you know? a great point. Yeah. Because fortunately at this place where I teach, I don't own it, of course, but I, I teach there. They do have like the most basic uh, espresso machine with a very basic uh, espresso grinder, but then they have the World Barista Championship equipment. So you can make a very good comparison and mainly the price, of course, but also what you can get and how it works. It is obviously a great piece of equipment. Its job is to, you know, create or showcase the coffee very well along with you as the barista. But uh, you're more likely to get a good shot of espresso off of something that's been, you know, crafted well. So imagine having that equipment is also a, a benefit because it showcases the potential of coffee a lot more. Yes, exactly. That's why I enjoy doing that comparison. Like, this is what you get with a very simple espresso machine. It's not bad. It's good. But if you do it in this other equipment, this ha this is how it can taste. Like, this is the difference. It's not just how it looks, but it has been built differently. And uh, it shows in the taste of your coffee. So, yeah, equipment absolutely is this game changer, especially in an area where, you know, things are new. And again, where you're elevating that baseline of excellence for everybody. And hopefully more in the next 10 years, maybe everyone will have or more people will have that like barista championship level coffee equipment. Even in the midst of that benefit, how do you as an educator manage people's expectations that you can't just rely on purchase power to deliver quality in your shop. Yes, to me that's the most most important skill that I teach, which is that like you need to realize what your budget is, what you can purchase and what the flavor of your coffee can be if you apply some good barista skills, not just like the Insta reels that you see where people spray the coffee beans and all that, <laughs> that oh, yeah. it, it just <laughs> looks beautiful, but that's not what you're doing at the coffee shop. So just what I want when I teach is people to understand that they need to learn, but most importantly, understand what they are doing and why they are doing that for. Like, it's not just, again, spraying the beans, but yes, it has like a background, but you need to understand like the whole process and then deliver a very high quality drink with whichever equipment you have. No, I love that. And it introduces kind of an interesting, maybe it's a problem uh, where it's, you'd mentioned the modern advent of, of having these Instagram reels of people doing, you know, the, the tools and the, the spritzing and the all this stuff. There's 17 steps now to make a, a great yeah. shot at home. I wonder if yeah. a lot of your, your baristas who obviously if they're coming to a coffee school are interested in coffee, they've started somewhere to look into it. Do you find yourself having to sort of deconstruct people's understanding based on media? A lot. <laughs> yeah. Mm. That happens every single coffee course. Like they, they have this question of, should I swirl the V60 or not? Like they've seen this James Hoffman video a thousand times. So they, I, that's a question that I always get asked, for example. Then the thing with the spraying the beans and now with how should I distribute? Should I get this tool or this tool? Or should I get three different tools or neither? Yeah, that's a, a question that I get a lot. And they don't have any really understanding quite yet, like on the baseline of things, but they're asking questions that are a little bit farther along. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. So it's not like they're bad questions. It's more like when you get the barista, myself and my, my training past, it's always the barista who wants to learn latte art, but they don't know how to steam milk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're really trying to get you to understand the fundamentals and as an educator, I suppose part of your job is to really sell people on the attractiveness of 
just always being fascinated by the fundamentals of of coffee. Yes. How do you do that effectively? Yeah, so that's quite a challenge, actually, because, well, you know, the DSEA has this program with three levels, foundation, intermediate, and professional. And of course, people, a lot of people always want to go straight to the intermediate level. They want to skip the, the foundation level. And I try to, well, let them know how important the foundation level is, because even though you've been in coffee for 10 years, there are might be a lot of things that have changed ever since you started. And if you haven't gotten any like continuous development, there might be quite a few things that you have missed. And that has happened to me a couple of times. And I tried to just avoid people going straight to the intermediate level. And I have, I have two <laughs> examples of that where they started with the intermediate level and they went back to the foundation level. Oh. So they, they, did finish the intermediate, but then they told me like, you know what, uh, I might want to do the foundation level as well. And they did. Oh, good for them for admitting it, you know, and maybe it's just a pride thing because we conflate passion and also just sheer, you know, exposure to content as a learning experience, which if you're saturated, you're in the midst of it, right? It almost feels as though you know it. Like you grew up in Costa Rica. You got coffee everywhere. You drank coffee, but you really didn't know anything about it. Exactly. And you you can't farm coffee just because you've been drinking it for a long time. So I, I guess it's like you, when you're training somebody, hopefully they're coming to you with the idea that they actually want to learn. Yes, yes. And I try to ask them, like when I get this question, like, do I need to do the foundation level before intermediate? I always reply with, it's not a prerequisite, but I do recommend it. And then they ask me like, well, why? And we have a small conversation if they want to. Some people are like, okay, then no. <laughs> but yeah, I've told a lot of people to really do take foundation seriously and they then they do and they they found, find out that there were a lot of things that they didn't know especially because the SEA has a different kind of course which is not the same content as the barista course in Costa Rica like the it's a weird thing but in Costa Rica we have the uh, coffee institute which they did this introduction to barista stuff but this course covers many different topics and in 20 hours, maybe. Yeah. So people tend to think that that course is the same as the Barista Skills Foundation level from the SEA. And it's not. So that's, that's quite a challenge for people to understand that. Yeah. And it's also, I think, especially, and I've noticed this in areas of the world where you do have this beginning, these growing markets that certifications are super important. Yes. And here in Costa Rica, the Costa Rican Coffee Institute certification is basically more important than the SEA. Oh, why is that? Because this national institute is very big. So it's basically the institution about coffee in Costa Rica. So... Um, people tend to think that that's the best way to learn about coffee. Yeah. Just the pedigree of it, just the enormity of yeah. it. Right. Okay. I mean, and, and ultimately similar to the espresso machine conundrum where I should have a lot of success in my coffee bar because I spent a lot of money on these grinders. These are like six E80 <laughs> Malkunigs and the whatever. If you have a lot of certifications, while they are great gateways, is there a level to which you have to manage people's expectations to say, even though you have a certificate and you've like maxed out your certificates, you know, how do you encourage people to not just plateau and continue to learn after achieving a certificate? Well, that's a very good question. And that's a challenge because, well, education not always translates in a higher paycheck, right? When you work as a barista. So it's mostly a personal achievement. And that's why a lot of people 
don't get into these certifications because, well, they're expensive, they're not cheap, but yeah, people then think, well, if I do learn a lot more, will that be perceived differently in my job or is it the same? And most of the time it's the same, unfortunately. And that's a matter of having owners who would actually care about that, which kind of means that back to your talking about how these folks who go through these courses, it was a pleasure place. They would be the kind of person who would respect that and actually look for it. Exactly. Yeah. Mm, Okay. Let me ask you this for you now, after doing this for so long as an educator and trainer, what are the most important tools that you have in your tool belt, the things that you use to help people truly learn something and retain the information that you've kind of honed over these years? Well, first of all, it's to contextualize people. That means knowing where they come from, if they have a relationship with coffee, because I, I've had a lot of different people from different backgrounds. As I mentioned, I have had coffee farmers. So I, I've had coffee farmers taking introduction to coffee, for example. <laughs> so yeah, and, and it's very interesting because they do learn a lot because I, I cover a lot of history of coffee and then they rethink about, yeah, maybe the history of Costa Rica is very important because we built it. We coffee producers, right? And okay. also, yeah, people who haven't seen a coffee plant they don't know how a coffee farm looks like so i have the two extremes so it's really important to know where people are coming from and what's their relationship with coffee and then always simplify and do not overcomplicate because well people understand easily if you talk to them in a very simple way and if you can avoid overcomplicating something, then it's better for them to understand. And then always being focused on continuous education, always like being updated what's happening and then sharing that knowledge. To me, that's very important. And it's important, I suppose, because there might be things that you've adjusted that maybe were wrong in the beginning. Yeah. I always mention this, like um, the distributing technique that used to be with the fingers. Now you don't put the fingers in your coffee anymore. Like, just <laughs> don't do that. And yeah, so that that's something that, that drastically changed. And but you still see people teaching that way. Yeah, that's true. And in I, I totally used to, you know distribute and there's all sorts of different pseudoscience around it that we pass yeah. back and forth between each other. There's the stock flesh method of distribution. There's the, you know, south, north, east, west, et cetera. Yeah. So there's updated information that in your point about simplicity, I think is really critical because going back to the idea that you need to do 17 things to the coffee to make it taste good just anecdotally, there was a friend who wanted to have me, you know, tweak his home espresso, not having a great time with espresso. So went there, saw his routine. He had all the gadgets and the things that you put on the top of the puck as a extra distribution block and all this stuff. And I said, okay, well, when the coffee comes out, put it in the porter filter and tamp it and then pull it. <laughs> Immediately the coffee tasted better. <laughs> Because it was too complicated and it wouldn't satisfy the most techie, desirous person that wanted to just really, you know, get in there and get complicated and work for their espresso. But it almost feels like you you are cheating by keeping things simple when you're educating. And you might overcomplicate it just to make yourself feel like you're doing more work. Yes, and, and I have some similar experiences because, well, there's this service that I really don't offer, but I get hired to do, which is going to people's house, people that I don't know, that own espresso machine, and they have no clue how to use it properly. And it's the same thing. Like, yeah, I've seen this YouTube video or this Insta Reel where they do these 15 steps, and I, I don't get it. It's like, you don't need to do that. Just let's tweak this and that, and there you go. 
and they are happy with it. <laughs> yeah, I've known people that have had their espresso machine new for a year and they haven't used it because they don't know how to use it. Yeah, that's a shame. If coffee is supposed to be, and it is better than it ever has been, we have more information available to us to you know, create better coffee at home and in, in the shop. But it seems like there's a, you know, in parallel to that, there's the complexities that come come into it and it paralyzes people. Like, I don't know what to do. These are all, I'm going to do it wrong if I don't get the right tool for it. But it seems pretty simple. Yeah. And also tools are very expensive. Yeah. Yeah. So why start if you have to get all of these tools? And I guess bringing it back to education, why start in coffee if in order to be even, you know, in the industry, you need to be perfect and you need to get, you know, educated for years and years before you can, you know, start your journey. So having these entry points in education and helping people be successful sooner seems like a really important thing. Yeah, people get to very like overwhelmed when they see this kind of educational content, quote unquote, and then they see or get to do the simple things and really focus on that, just the simple things and taste a great coffee. I think that's the most important part that it's, it's not that complicated. It has, so you need to understand a lot of things, but when you do it, it's not that complicated. And that's what an educator is for bringing you to that point, right? Yeah. I think that's the most important part. Like, just keep it simple. Wonderful. Well, Fabiola, this was awesome. I really appreciate you being on the show and talking about all of these things. You know, if you're listening to the show, you're probably a learner. You know, we should always cultivate a learning spirit. And it's great to have people like you out there really fostering that culture of continuous education and learning and growing and keeping things simple for people so they can enjoy great coffee. So where can we learn more about what you do and follow you online and all that fun stuff? Yeah. So the website is uh, Soy Barista, which is not soy for soy sauce. That means I am in in Spanish because I get (laughs) that a lot. So it's soybarista.com and social media, Instagram and Facebook, it's the same, Soy Barista, and it ends in a CR from Costa Rica. So Soy Barista CR. You can get all the information. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for being on the show. It's great to talk with you today. It was a pleasure. Well, I hope that you all enjoyed that conversation and it was so great to end on the note of simplicity and keeping things simple and also making yourself a lifelong learner. That makes you a better educator. It means you a better participant in the community so you can raise that base level of excellence the way that Fabiola has been doing for so long. And in all of her learnings and development, obviously simplicity is one of these things that that means a lot because she's seen the most fruit from this. Whether you're in a producing country that is just really developing these foundations of great retail and roasting and coffee culture, or you're in a coffee community that has a longer history, creating educational content and inroads for equipping people through simplicity and making sure you're thinking about who it is that you're talking to and teaching accordingly. These are all great pieces of advice from a seasoned professional. And so a huge thank you to Fabiola for joining me on the show today. If you want more information about what Fabiola does, want to follow along, go to her website, soybarista.com, and also check out the Instagram account at soybaristacr, CR for Costa Rica. I know that Fabiola has a few interviews out there, Spanish language podcasts and YouTube interviews. So definitely look up her name in those channels and hear what she has to say in those interviews as well. And so again, a huge thank you to you, Fabiola, for joining us on the show. Now, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback about today's episode, please do email me, chris at keystotheshop.com. That's C-H-R-I-S at keystotheshop.com. That's also where you can reach out if you're interested in coaching and consulting with Keys to the Shop Consulting, chris at keystotheshop.com. Now, speaking of education and continuing your education and training and resourcing people to just develop and mature as professionals and help the industry mature, 
Coffee Fest Trade Show for the last three decades has been an integral part of helping people start their businesses on the right foot and just resourcing retailers with great information, connecting them with great vendors and with each other. So yeah, obviously coffeefest.com is where you should go to learn more information. This trade show is a trade show. It has vendors, it has booths. You can interact with the products and the people behind them but it's also a place that focuses on education. So you've got free or accessibly priced lectures, panel discussions, trainings, and the like that will cover a range of topics at each show that is sure to address a very relevant and poignant issue for you and your coffee shop. I give lectures at these shows all the time, all year, and I would love to see you at the show. You can get 50% off your registration for general admission when you use the code KEYS, K-E-Y-S. For general admission, that's 50% off using the code KEYS. Coming up this year, we've got Anaheim, California, and then Orlando, Florida. So some pretty sunny locations. And if you're a Disney fan, of course, you know, you've got the two coasts operating there. So you get to go to both locations if you're into that. So that's a double benefit of going to Coffee Fest. So again, you should go to coffeefest.com for more information and I hope to see you there. And with that, that is the end of our episode today, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. I really appreciate you all supporting Keys to the Shop. Be sure to subscribe to the show Follow on Instagram at Keys to the Shop. You can always reach me there if you want to send a DM. I always encourage people to share these episodes, especially on social media. It really helps out a lot. Share it with your friends, with your team. Share it with that guy that squeezes the bags of coffee and smells it before he buys it. He needs to hear about these things. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop. <laughs>